Income tax 2023-2024 interest income tax software example. Get ready and some coffee because we need some extreme concentration when doing income tax preparation 2023-2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our crunching numbers is my cardio product line. Now, I'm not saying that subscribing to this channel, crunching numbers with us, will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So, you know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise. So you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in our form 1040 example problem using Lacert tax software. You don't need tax software to follow along, but if you have access to tax software, it's a great tool to run scenarios with. You can also get access to the forms, schedules, instructions at the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Our taxpayer at our normal starting point, Adam Taxman, just trying to avoid a dang tax man, living in 90210 Beverly Hills, back to a single filer, no dependents, W-2 income starting at 100000 Standard deduction, 13850 Taxable income, 86150 Mirroring that on our Excel worksheet formula format, we have the 100000 income, 13850 Taxable income now at the 86150 Tax being calculated by the Lacert software, page 2 at the 14266 we now want to be thinking about interest income. If I go back to page one, typically you're going to get a form something like this, which will be a 1099 INT form usually, although interest can be reported on other forms if there's a flow through entity like a partnership or an S corporation on a K-1, but it's still usually fairly straightforward that it's going to be interest, although it's a little bit harder to organize your forms to double check them. Sometimes you might have some kind of interest that's reported on a 1099 div as well, but uh, and also note that the interest form not might not always look exactly like this because the financial institutions might structure the form a little bit differently, putting possibly the interest and the uh, dividend form close to each other because the same financial institution often is responsible for issuing a 1099 interest and a 1099 div because both of those things are typical of, of investment institutions. Now, where do we report this or where will we see this coming through on the form 1040? We have line uh, 2A, which has the tax exempt interest to be the taxable interest. So both uh, exempt and taxable interest being shown on the schedule. So even if we're not being taxed on it, we need to basically show it and we'll still see the evidence of it there in part because you would think the government wants to see if we get a large amount of interest income, whether it be taxable or not, they can tell that we must have a decent amount of money put away somewhere that's generating interest. So then if this amount goes over a certain dollar amount, then you'd have to attach Schedule B. So Schedule B not required, but unless it goes, unless it is, right? Not required unless it is. If it goes over a dollar amount, we have the interest and uh, ordinary dividends. We're focusing in on interest this time. And in this case, we'd have to list the name of the payer because now the IRS wants to know who paid you. If any interest is from a seller finance mortgage, and the buyer used the property as a personal residence, see the instructions. So that's gonna be one somewhat of a special situation. So let's imagine just a normal interest situation. We're gonna go back on over and say that we had interest income. Let's just say it came from bank number one. And I'm just gonna say that it was $100. And so now I'm gonna go back on over. That would typically be on a form 1040, box number one interest income if any box is populated that's a little bit confusing then of course you can go to the instructions 
find this form on the IRS website or if you have access to it with your data input, look at the instructions part of it. If I go back to the form 1040, you'll note that the Schedule B is not highlighted because the, the, uh, it's not over the dollar amount to have to add the second schedule. So just to realize there's with these other schedules, normally if you were gonna make this from scratch and make up the forms, you would probably, like we did here, say I'm gonna have all the income pull into one line item on the first page and everything else be on a separate form like the Schedule B. In our case, I put it over here. So let's add another income line item. We had W-2 income, and now I'm just gonna pull the total down and add interest income here. And this would be pulling in similar to like a Schedule B. We could make a whole nother schedule for uh, interest and dividend income, or we can basically, I'm gonna put it on one worksheet this time for now at least. Interest, interest income. So I'm gonna highlight this home tab, font group. Let's make it black and white. And then I'll leave some space for multiple institutions. Let's go down to like, well, let's do it down to here. Make that, I'm gonna make it blue and bordered. I'm gonna move this down a bit further. And then I'll just mirror this. This, this So this is gonna be total in interest income. And we'll say this came from bank one was $100. The total, I'll just sum it up equals the sum of that. Boom, $100. Now I need to include that in the total down below, which is the W-2 income plus the interest income is now at the $100,100, which is pulling in our formula to page one. So again, logistically, you would think that the tax return would use the sub schedules in order to feed into like the main sheet as we are doing here. And that would be the use of the schedule B. But you'll recall that uh, historically what the IRS wanted to do, it seems to me, is to try to make a very short form because that was, that was advantageous, especially when you had to do them by paper and not by software. So they wanted to put everything on one page that they could. So these line items being broke out down here have been there for some time as kind of a legacy type of thing instead of just summing everything up into income. And the reason they want the Schedule B isn't basically or originally wasn't so they can sum everything up to the first page, but rather to get more information only when you need it is, would be the general idea. So the Schedule B is listing the institutions and the IRS is going to want that added information breaking out the individual uh, interest incomes. Uh, if, if your income is over a certain threshold, that would indicate that you're fairly well off because interest is usually fairly low in terms of a rate of interest. So if you're getting over 1,500 of interest, you must have a you know, fairly substantial amount of money in the bank would be the idea. And the IRS might want to, you know, it kind of gives an idea of the IRS to keep an eye on someone who might, you know, if they die or something, they want to make sure that they come pick your pockets with the death tax or something like that. Might give them a heads up on, I don't know. No, I'm just kidding. I don't really know. <laughs> but let's go back on over and say, we could of course have multiple institutions. So we might have like added bank. We've got bank number two and or and and gives us interest let's say of of uh, 170 so we're still well under the limit and therefore those two are going to be combined and pull into basically page one of the form 1040 now at 270 we can mirror that on our excel worksheet by going to our income and say now we have bank two at 170 which is pulling into 250 on the interest, 100, 270, going back over 100, 270, 13, 850 of the standard deduction still gives us taxable income, 86, 420. So 86, 420, and then the tax, I won't adjust the tax, but the tax would be calculated based on that. The interest is not a separate, a separate rate thus far, because this has been taxable interest, which will be taxed at the normal progressive rates thus far. So then we could say, okay, well, what if we had a large amount of interest because we've been doing really well or something. So we're like, okay, we got a lot of, we did good last year.
But now the now the IRS wants to know what did you do in order to make that money? We're suspicious. So we're going to say, let's say we made another uh, 1,700 of interest, right? And so now I'm going to go, okay, let's go back on over to the forms. So now the form 1040 still is going to pull that in to, we said it was still uh, taxable. So it's still being pulled in as uh, taxable interest, but now the schedule B has been triggered. And so now we need to attach the schedule B, which is just adding up the institutions, adding up to the 1,970, which is then pulling over to the, the form 1040. Now, of course, the IRS would typically have the forms that would add up to these dollar amounts on their side, right? So they can kind of double check it because the 1099s would have been given to you as well as to uh, the IRS is the, is the general idea. Now then you could imagine that you have tax exempt interest. So we have, so interest on US savings bonds here and in line eight, tax exempt interest. So let's say we have tax exempt interest and go back on over and say, okay, this is gonna be bank number four. And we're gonna say now it was, let's say US bonds T-bills. Uh, and we'll say, or I'll say it over here, this is, this is so now we have uh, total municipal bonds and then in-state municipal bonds so you have to also kind of be aware of what the state uh, tax rules are going to be with regards to it as well if you have an income tax for the state and so on so but i'm going to go back on over and say okay so now i have 300 that is in the tax exempt interest and 1000 uh, 970 in uh, the taxable interest. If I go to my schedule B, we can see then we only are listing basically the taxable interest. So I'm still, this is kind of like a reporting requirement here, but not really having an impact on the return. So if I went and mirrored that on my software, I might say like tax exempt. So bank, this was, what was I on here? This was bank uh, three which I said was 1,700, we said, or something like that. And then bank four, I might say this was exempt just for reporting purposes, say 300 on the outside, because it's, it's exempt, so it's not being included in our calculation down below. And then we can say, okay, 1,970 is pulling over to page one, 102,270. So, so now we're at 1,970. Oh, hold on, I can't put it there because now it's summing up in this total. So I'm gonna put it on the outside. I'll put it out over here so it's not included. So this is my exempt interest area just for reporting purposes on my worksheet. So now I'm, I'm at 101,970, 101,970, 101,970, okay? And then 88,120, 88,120, okay? Now we mentioned before that sometimes it's possible you might get like a 1099 div that has an interest uh, component in it. So in other words, if I go back on over here and I go to my, if I got a 1099 and I say, okay, I'm going down to my, now I've got my 1099 for dividends. So I'm gonna look for the 1099 div income. And then I'm gonna say this was investment one or something, but, they put over here a, a tax exempt interest line on the 1099 dividend, which is kind of unusual because you would think that that would, that would be on a 1099 INT. But again, because you, you have some situations where the same institution possibly is dealing with the, the uh, dividends, which are related to investing in stocks and bonds, which are uh, interest, which is related to investing in bonds, then sometimes you might have an interest component on the 1099 div, which should be fairly well uh, shown on the form. And then the data input form for most software is pretty easy to find. So if it was another, let's say $500 there, the data input is easy generally then because your software will kind of match it up. And then when you pull on over, uh, when you pull on over, it still shows up over here, right? So now I've got the 800. And if I mirror that in my software, I had the 300 plus the 500 is the total 800 of the exempt 
amount. I could sum these up. Do, 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 do. Right. And so so the only thing that's a little tricky about that is that is that then when you're trying to double check your numbers and like where did that 800 come from, you're probably lining up all of your 1099 interest forms. And then sometimes you're going to have this 1099 that was a dividend and that sometimes the dividend forms and the interest forms are kind of clumped together because they come from the same institution or you have a dividend form that has this interest component on it which which makes it a little bit harder to kind of organize your documents sometimes when you're doing the data input or checking your numbers now note you could have a similar thing going on with like pass-through entities so if you get a if you get a k1 or something like that then you could have a, a similar kind of thing so so like a pass-through entity k1 for like a partnership for example and you could say okay i had a now note like if you're doing individual taxes you might say hey look i'm not going to do the business tax returns meaning i'm not going to do the partnership tax return but you might be willing to say if you if someone else does the partnership tax return i'm willing to take the k1 and do the data input from the K1 because that's usually fairly straightforward uh, from an individual income tax preparation, you know, side of things. Once the partnership return has been created, and then again, you could have within your income line items here uh, uh, interest. But usually, again, the line items of the K1 that flows through to the to the individual tax return is usually pretty lined up in your data input software to the actual k1 so it's fairly easy to do the data input normally so let's say you had interest income here of 890 that came through and so then if i go to my schedule b or let me go back on over to the 1040 so now that is being included in this uh 2860 and it's flowing through from the k1 and you have a, a k1 worksheet and whatnot that can kind of show that the reason I want to point that out here is just because, again, that becomes another one that's a little bit tricky when I'm trying to tie out this number to uh, to my forms because I'm trying to organize my forms and this all came from the 1099 interest. But now I've got this K1, which usually you know would flow into the, you know like an income line item or something like that. But now it's flowing that now that has an interest component to it, which I have to take into consideration when I'm trying to double check this number. Okay. Now let's think about a situation where you had a 1099. This is an unusual situation. You got a 1099 for interest. So that would mean that you would have to record an income, but for whatever reason, it's not actually your interest income. It's the income of somebody else. And so the, in, the 1099 is coming to you. You might have reporting requirements to report it to someone else. And we saw some examples of these like nominees uh, or, or, uh, when we had the mortgage situation in a prior presentation. So the general idea would be, well, now I got a 1099 that's assigned to me, but if, and if I, but I don't think it's, it has to be recorded in income for me. It has to be recorded in income for somebody else. But if I don't put the money in to the tax return, if I, especially if I'm over a certain dollar amount, even if I'm not, the IRS will add up the 1099s and see that what I reported is less than what they have. And therefore, I need to show on my return the same amount. So how do I do that? How do I record the amount so they can tie it out to what they have, but still uh, reduce it again so that, so that I can report the proper amount? So let's imagine, for example, I'm going to just call this bank number five. And let's say I'm just going to make up a large number so we can see it, 6,000 of interest. So we have interest coming through, but it's not for us for whatever reason. And you can see in this data input, we have the adjustments to the federal tax interest, nominee interest, accrued interest, tax exempt interest, original issue discount, amortizable bonds. So see, these were some of those kind of more unusual situations that we talked about in a prior presentation. I'm just going to say it was a nominee interest and say that it was... Uh, we're going to put 6,000 here. So now I'm going to go back on over and say, okay, so now if I go to my 10, 1040 page one, it's not impacting here. If I go to the schedule B, I could say, what happened? Well, now I've got bank one, two, three, four, and five. There's the 6,000 that I included. And then it's subtotaling. So it's adding all that up. 
And then it's given me another line item taking this back out again, and it's calling it a nominee distribution. So, so you could put you know, more information possibly in the line item there uh, describing it, but that's the general idea. So now the, the IRS can say, okay, my number that we got on the 1099s matches what was reported to, by the taxpayer. So the IRS is saying we see 8,860 reported and the Schedule B shows 8,860, but then we took out the 6,000 telling them why so that they can see what's happening. And now we're at the 2,860. So that's the general idea. So the, the rule to take away from this is that uh, the, any form that you get, 1099-W2, the IRS has it, right? So if you report something less than the forms that you get, then you're probably going to be questioned. If there's a rationale as to why to do that, uh, then, then you're going to have to show that on the return somehow. Or if it's an error in the form, then you've got to go back to the person that issued the form to fix it, right? You'd have to go back to them and say, you need to reissue the form because the IRS has it and I, not, I need to report the right dollar amount and that's not going to match what the IRS has. Uh, so that's going to be the, the general idea. So generally, interest usually fairly straightforward uh, for most uh, taxpayers driven by the 1099 interest forms, although interest can come through in other forms as well, like the pass-through entity forms. And then of course, we have to determine whether or not the interest is taxable or not, which again is usually fairly well defined on the, on the, on the data input forms, the 1099 interest forms.